to what Al just read to you, the preamble to the Constitution. Here's what Douglas said about the preamble to the Constitution. Douglas saw the Constitution as having, and I quote, noble purposes which were avowed in his preamble, who words about liberty render it as an instrument that could be yielded, I mean wielded, in behalf of emancipation. That preamble to the Constitution is so important. My brother spoke earlier. He said the Constitution reads, we the people. It doesn't say we the white people. This is important because I am a graduate of Alabama A&M University. And when I, when I attend college there, I was taught, I was taught that the founding fathers gave us slavery in the Constitution. I was taught that the founders gave us slavery in the Constitution directly pointing to the three-fifth clause to say that blacks were three-fifths of a human being. So therefore, when the Constitution was written, blacks were excluded from the Constitution. That's what I was taught. That's what I believed. Until God took me on the path and started studying the writings of Frederick Douglass. Again, Frederick Douglass said the Constitution reads, we the people. It doesn't say we the white people. So if black folks are people then, we are to be included as benefactors what's in that Constitution. If you read the preamble, it goes further and says that we want to secure the blessings of liberty for our posterity. That means future generations. That includes my children. That includes your children because it doesn't say we, the white people, want to include the blessing of posterity for our white children. It says we, the people, we, the people. Frederick Douglass is so key. He is so important because what Frederick Douglass has taught me that the founding fathers, while some of them owned slaves, they still were able to write a document that said we, the people. And so therefore, why as black folks sometimes, why do we exclude ourselves from the Constitution? Why do we discriminate against ourselves and say the Constitution has nothing to do with us? That's not what Douglas said. And I thought about it one time, if I was a slave on a plantation years ago, and I had somebody come to me and say, hey, this Constitution was written where it says we the people, and we're gonna use that for our emancipation one day, you would've had my ear. But what if somebody come to me and say, you know what, the Constitution doesn't, doesn't consider us. We're excluded from it. Guess what, y'all? We're going to be slaves the rest of our lives. Ah, thank God there's a friend of Douglas. And this three-fifth clause thing that it, I need to share this with you because, again, I was taught. And it is still a thought among many black Americans today that the three-fifth clause was a statement to say that blacks are three-fifths of a human being. Now, Douglas believed that himself at one time. He struggled with the Constitution. But Douglas did something very interesting. Douglas went back and read the Constitution for himself. Then he read the Founding Fathers' convention notes. When he put the two together, Douglas said, wait a minute. The, the Constitution is not a pro-slavery document. The Constitution is an anti-slavery document. The Constitution is an anti-slavery document. And Douglas went on to say that the Constitution, the three-fifth clause, excuse me, the three-fifth clause has nothing to do to say blacks are three-fifths of a human being. But when you go back and read for yourself and become an independent critical figure in a speech that Douglas gave in 1861 in Glasgow, Scotland, it was Douglas that gave clarity to the Constitution. He said the Constitution is not to say blacks are three-fifths of a human being. What the three-fifth clause is all about, you got to remember now that the southern states, the slave states, wanted to count blacks in captivity as one person, one vote. They weren't going to free them, but while they were slaves, to count them as one person, one vote. The northern free states said, wait, if you free them, we'll let you count them as one person, one vote. But since you can't free them, we got to have a compromise here. And the compromise was to, to allow the southern states to count the slave population as three-fifths of a vote, not as five-fifths of a vote. So what happened, what happened was that three-fifth compromise, it cut the slave states' congressional representation. 
So the slave states did not have a majority in Congress with those who want to keep slavery alive. It was Douglas who said that in 1861. I didn't study Douglas in college. He was not introduced to me in college. I studied Douglas on my own. God led me to Frederick Douglas. Frederick Douglas is the father of the civil rights movement. It started with Douglas. Dr. King is the son of the civil rights movement. My brother mentioned earlier how Douglas was so, so powerful in his influence and his writings that Dr. King got many of his ideas and strategies from Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was a genuine constitutionalist. He respected the founding fathers. He respected the constitution. He believed in limited government and he believed in personal responsibility. These four things make up the life empowering values of Frederick Douglass, a man who was born below poverty. He did not even own his own body. Didn't own a pair of shoes until he was eight years old. Never slept in a bed until the age of 10. Never attended school any time in his life. Ended up writing three books. Learned how to read and write while he was on the plantation. While he was on entitlements. Escaped from slavery at the age of 20. Got involved in the abolitionist movement. Those who want to abolish slavery. It was Frederick Douglass who declared political world slavery. Frederick Douglass was an advisor to five U.S. presidents, Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses S. Grant, James Garfield, Rutherford Hayes, and Benjamin Harrison. Frederick Douglass was a capitalist. He was an entrepreneur. He wrote three books. He was a public speaker. He owned two newspaper companies. Douglass died in 1895 as a result of a heart attack at the age of 77. Here's a trivia question for you. How much money do you think that Douglas had amassed in savings at the time of his death? Any guesses? $300,000. You're right. Douglas had $300,000 in savings, which means that he earned a lot more. But $300,000 today, uh, back then, is $25 million today. How did he do it? How did this man rise from a situation where he was below poverty? All the odds are against him. He, was, he succeeded in a system that he was not supposed to succeed in. How did he do it? He embraced the Constitution where he escaped and he discovered his God-given gifts and his God-given talents. And he created a product. He created a service that people wanted. And he created wealth for himself and for his family, and he employed others. Frederick Douglass is the key. Frederick Douglass is the key to promote racial healing in this country. The racism that exists in the United States today, it is pale in comparison to the racism that Douglass dealt with. When Douglass wrote his first book, he was a fugitive slave. He could have been put back into prison, into, into slavery, excuse me. Douglas teaches that the way you deal with racism is not to insult, instigate, and finger point. You have to impact and interact. Think about it. You interact and impact. I'll give you an example. When Douglas escaped from slavery 10 years after he escaped, one of the things he did, he wrote a letter to his former slave master. And he said in that letter, I forgive you for all the things you did to me. He said, as a matter of fact, you are welcome to come to my house anytime and eat at my table and under my roof. I'm not going to make you eat outside like you made me eat outside. He said, uh, I want you to come because I want to, he dug and said in that, in, that, in that letter, I'm going to use you to show men how to treat each other. And he said, oh, by the way, I want you to free all those slaves on your plantation, all 400 of them. And until you do, I'm going to write about you in my books. I'm going to speak about you and talk about you whenever I go talk and speak. I'm going to put you on Facebook and I'm going to put you on Twitter. I'm going to call you out. And don't you know, 20 years before the Emancipation, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, that slave master had freed all the slaves because of Douglas' agitation. Douglas put pressure on them agitation works. So I'll tell you this, this rally is not about the Democrat Party, it's not about the Republican Party, it's not about black, and it's about, not about white, it's about us coming together 
sharing the same values, the same values to make this country strong once again, to create jobs once again, and to create posterity for your children and my children. And I can leave you with a quote from a gentleman by the name of Robert Brown Elliott. During Reconstruction, Robert Brown Elliott was a congressman out of South Carolina. He happened to be a black Republican. Robert Brown Elliott has a quote that I love. And this is how I guide my life. And I wish you do the same. Robert Brown Elliott said this. He said, I am a slave to Christian principles. I call no political party master. That's what it's all about. It's all about kingdom building. It's about voting our values. It doesn't matter which political party you're in. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or you're a Republican. What matters most is this. Are you voting in a way that shows your love and your faithfulness to the God you say you serve? That's what it's all about. And God will hold you accountable for the way you vote. Some folks think they can go into a booth and when they go in that booth they close the curtain that God can't see what's going on. But don't forget now, he is omnipresent. So I share that with you. I leave that with you. Don't take anything I've said today for granted. Read for yourself. Study for yourself. Study carefully to show yourself approved. Become an independent, critical thinker. That's what Douglas taught me. The slave master used the Bible to justify slavery. Douglas came back and used the Bible to end slavery. Become an independent, critical thinker. Don't allow anybody to tell you who you should worship. And don't allow anybody to tell you how you should vote. You do it for yourself, what's good for you and your family, and most importantly to the God that you say that you serve. That's what this is all about. So I thank you for your time. I thank you for your presence. As you go, and we go our separate ways at the, at the end of the day, may God be with you. Again, God bless you all. One more time for K. Carl Smith. It has been my absolute pleasure to get to know uh, Keith over the past few years. And every single time I hear him speak, I learn something.